All right, welcome everyone. It's my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome Heidi Prather. Um, Heidi and I have known each other now for 22 and a half years. I can't believe it. It makes me feel so, so young. <laughs> um, and you can read all of her accomplishments um, and, and being the vice chair in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery is no uh, small accomplishment. Um, and division chief of physical medicine and rehab and, and runs the spine center there is uh, past president of the North American Spine Society. And it sounds funny for me to say it this way, but is really the reason that I'm here, except not here here. Vayner's the reason I'm here because he actually <laughs> hired me. But the reason I do what I do is because of Heidi. So it is definitely my pleasure to introduce her and she's gonna talk uh, more about uh, hip and spine. Great, so thanks for having me and thanks for coming on a snowy day. Um, I'm going to talk about the interaction between hip and spine. This is my current big uh, research endeavor, and hopefully I'll see. I think I got asked to put in a little female athlete or female gender specific, so hopefully I will do that. And I'm going to end with a little bit of a, what I'm trying to do at Saint, in St. Louis at WashU right now, um, and I would love some feedback on it uh, because I've been working on it for quite some time. So I don't have any. Uh, disclosures for this talk at all. So the interplay between the hip and spine can be a conundrum for both patients and the healthcare providers. So hopefully we're going to go over who are these patients, the theoretical mechanisms between these connections, the functional targets, and what the treatments are. And we're all real familiar with, um, these are some of the original drawings from lumbar radiculopathy, facet pain, and SI point, joint pain, like the distributions of pain. Uh, look kind of similar, and we are comfortable with structurally might be associated with uh, some of these things. However, this pain diagram can look very much like the first uh, slide that we saw, and we know the hip can also refer in distributions that are similar to pelvic girdle pain as well as similar to lumbar spine pain. In fact, Kahn's study in way back in 04 said that over 47% of people with hip arthritis had pain below their knee, and then the Lesher study um, took the pain diagrams of people who had an intraarticular injection, and after that injection, if they had 90% relief of pain, and their injection was related to osteoarthritis, they then took their pain diagrams and laid them over each other, and that's what they came up with. So the hip can look like the back, the hip can look like the pelvis, the back can look like the hip, it's a conundrum, okay? And then there's all these extraarticular things, and we just went through that with a patient that came tonight. That was a great example of having, you know, two, uh, two different areas or two different things causing pain in an overlapping fashion. And we know there's myofascial ITB, trigger points, the piriformis, deep lateral rotators, and then there's the also familiar, I heard everywhere patient, uh, that pushing on any of these points might refer pain in those other distributions. So then there's also this... Uh, the idea of thinking about when two things happen at once. And that's probably more common in a lot of the MSK patients we see who have problems for a considerable amount of time, right? They adapt to what, from what might be a primary injury and you have an adaptive problem that then occurs and you can have things that hurt in more than one place. And that's where the hip spine syndrome was initially coined. And it was originally described as just case series descriptions of people that had spinal stenosis and hip arthritis. And that's a, those original descriptions were just that, in a series of like 20 patients or less. It was actually described by Afeskri in uh, 1983 as to three different subtypes in the syndrome. There was the simple, which is the structural diagnosis in both. That would be, I have spinal stenosis and I have hip arthritis. And surgeons want to know about that because they want to figure out which one should I operate on first, right? And we want to know which one should I treat first or which one... Uh, should I angle my uh, intervention at first uh, will be helpful to us. There's complex, which is there's degenerative changes at the hip that might, or, or spine that might contribute to pain. So spine pain might refer to the hip region, and that could be extraarticular and vice versa. And then there was secondary, and I think that's really related to adaptive changes from one contribution to symptoms in the other. So if I have um, uh, early arthritis in my hip, I might, stop, I might develop posterior pelvic girdle or back pain, which is just like we saw in the patient we just examined. So there aren't really, these haven't really been described in the literature segregated like this, but I think they're actually there in the literature, we just haven't called it that. So if you look at, I think this would be the complex category if you look at the literature. We've got literature that shows patients with low back pain have an increased incidence of hip OA on their x-ray. And we know that people will have improvements in their low back pain if they get their hip replaced. Um, study I put together looked at um, 
people who had had their hip replaced and you went backwards uh, before and after their hip replacement. Those who had back pain and were treated for that did worse after their hip replacement than those that didn't, cost more, and their episodes of care lasted uh, almost 13 months longer. Patients with spinal stenosis don't do as well after a hip replacement. It was one of his original studies. And then patients with hip arthrodesis, seven out of nine excessive motion of lumbar spine or ipsilateral knee, and nine out of nine complained of low back pain at four years. And in fact, the most common reason a patient decides to convert from hip arthrodesis to a hip replacement is not their hip pain, their low back pain. So those are kind of the evidence I would put together as complex. But what about that secondary? And I think that exists there too. I think our literature that shows the low back pain and pelvic girdle pain are coinciding together. Literature that shows low back pain is associated with an active straight leg raise, which we just demonstrated in the room. Low back pain associated with reduced hip internal rotation. We know that's um, prevalent now in the literature, as well as low back pain associated with early lumbopelvic motion, which was that maneuver I was showing you earlier. This is all from the sports literature, the evidence of hip range of motion associated with spine problems. So in people with low back pain, we know prior work suggests that less active medial rotation is associated with low back pain, less passive medial rotation than lateral rotation is associated with low back pain. Deficits in active and passive medial rotation is associated with it, as well as deficits in the dominant leg for both active and passive medial rotation, as well as less hip flexion. And those bottom three were all done in rotational sports, particularly golf and tennis, um, that, sh that looked at people in those cohorts, and if they had low back pain, this is what some of their range of motion deficits were. This goes back to the test I was showing you earlier, looking at early lumbopelvic motion. The left side is uh, Linda Van Dillen's uh, lab. Um, you're looking up, the, the red uh, dot there at the bottom there is the knee vent and flexion, and the rest of the dots are up higher towards the trunk where she's got labels on the lateral hip, the sacrum, and the lumbar spine. And the right side of the screen is Heidi's dummy down version of doing it in clinic. So you can see when she, we externally rotate this person's hip, or you can see her whole pelvis come up off the table, even if you can't see the hand. So looking at those motions, she's demonstrated that with repeated limb movements associated with early or excessive lumbopelvic motion may be a contributor to low back pain, and that people with low back pain just demonstrate earlier and greater lumbopelvic motion during hip external rotation and internal rotation than people without low back pain. We also know there's a gender difference between these two. Early lumbopelvic motion is more commonly found in men than women with back pain, and early lumbopelvic motion with hip internal rotation is more common in men than women. And more men had increased low back pain with hip internal external rotation. So more men, when we move their hip, could reproduce some of their back pain if they had these early lumbopelvic motion, mo movements. But why would we care about this movement pattern? Well, we know if we restrict the lumbopelvic movement during these hip movements, it results in immediate improvement in their low back pain. Again, so that goes back to tail wagging the dog there. If we can figure out which one's causing which, we might be able to help people more. So is it more than hip and spine? So based on a response to injection, one spine surgeon found that more than one area is painful, and this is Sembrano's study, and it's out of a VA, and they, they, everybody, everybody came in and had back pain, and they injected them in all three places, and this was the results of the relief and pain, which kind of shows you there's a ton of overlap going on here. And if you're just relying on the needle to tell you where it is, you're going to be shooting a lot of things, is what this tells me. But it does really demonstrate well that people can have multiple sources of pain. So what about those patients that are not in a spine specialist's office? Okay. So these are our uh, pain diagrams of folks. Uh, we described uh, the first uh, surgical groups with each of these disorders. So uh, the top one is from our publication in 2006, and those are folks that had asked to have labral tears that did not have significant hip deformity. The 2009 article is FAI. That's the distribution of pain in patients with FAI. And then the last one to your right is the distribution of pain in patients with DDH. Now remember, these are all patients on their way to an OR. So this isn't just average Joe that maybe you and I are seeing, but these are people at the end of, this, uh, end of the road, and as they're going to the OR, this is what their pain diagram looks like. But what you'll notice there, particularly in the FAI group, it's up to most, almost 30% of them can have some form of back pain, meaning above the buttock. Now, I didn't get to influence the diagram in 2006, but I got to influence the diagram <laughs> in the FAI study in 2009, and we made sure we asked people above uh, the PSIS or not, so L5 and down. So that was important because it kind of helped me get started on looking at these connections prior to arthritis in the hip. 
So what if we use a physical exam to look beyond the spine as an additional source for low back pain? So this is my study, and it finally got published. Um, this is my second password grant from a long time ago. And um, we looked at 101 patients consecutively walking into the office for low back pain. Couldn't have surgery, couldn't have another disorder, couldn't have had you know, some metabolic disorder, couldn't be pregnant. But otherwise, it was all comers walking in. I didn't discriminate by age, and I did not discriminate by length of time of pain. Just trying to get a real um, consensus of what real life looks like. And this is what their pain diagrams look like, which is kind of like what average Joe looks like. 25% uh, of them had an antalgic gait, 38% of them had pain if they stood just on one leg, and 30% of them were unable to hold a single leg stance, meaning they had weakness somewhere across the pelvic girdle. This is looking at their lumbar spine range of motion, neural tension signs, and they look like your average low back pain population. They had most of, uh, about 60% of them had pain with lumbar extension, and about 32% of them had no pain with neural tension signs, meaning they had only axial pain. And then there was a variability of femoral nerve versus perineal versus tibial bias and, and slump sit mechanisms throughout. So they look like your average low back pain population. But then we looked at the hip range, uh, hip range of motion in, these, in this group, and we compared them to asymptomatic gender match controls that I told you about we did prior to this. And we found that the low back pain population had significantly less hip flexion and hip internal rotation measured with a goniometer. We also showed that if you looked at that reduction in hip flexion, it was also associated significantly worse with function, both of and spine and hip, as well as internal rotation showed reduced uh, function in their lumbar spine score. So there's, there's some kind of relationship between, again, range of motion, pain, and function. And then to look at their provocative hip tests, and if the, the, the ones, the three to your right there are the ones that are validated. So a positive impingement sign was found in somewhere around 63% of folks, and a log roll was found around 32%. And some people have more than one. If I then looked at pain and function related to these factors, we found those who had a positive hip impingement, a log roll test, were worst, had significantly worse hip and spine pain and function. And those with a positive favor sign also had worse hip and spine functional scores. So again, there's a relationship to those who have these provocative tests in, in conjunction with their low back pain presentations. It kind of gives us a hint that maybe we should be looking here when we're looking at folks with chronic problems. So if we looked at measurements of the available hip radiographs, now I didn't have a grant for this, so the only people I could x-ray were the ones that had a positive provocative test, because that's how I can tell the insurance company they need to pay for it, right? So if we took, uh, of that 101, it was 65 people at a positive provocative test, and we looked for FAI measurements, anywhere between 71 and 17% had at least one measure uh, that was consistent with FAI. And I used the upper limit of an alpha angle at 60 degrees, uh, which is what, what's uh, commonly accepted now as the cutoff. Um, so that's kind of at the high, the high um, at the at the end point where people say over 60 is consistent, is very consistent with FAI. So it was a, a large number of folks. If we looked at their DDH measurements, that was less, so it was around 14%. And then OA measurements, uh, this was the nice thing about it is only about uh, a little less than 20% of the patients in this population had OA that was uh, moderate to severe. So this was the first cohort of looking at hip exam maneuvers in people without significant hip OA, or the, or the major pop population was without hip OA. Again, 88% had at least one positive hip radiograph finding. So if we looked again um, uh, at their pain and function, those with pincer measurements, they had worse uh, hip and uh, spine functional scores, and moderate OA, they were worse in everything, which fits with the previous literature that was descriptive. So in summary, 65% of the patients with low back pain had two or more positive provocative tip tests and had worse baseline pain and functional scores. Reduced hip flexion and internal rotation correlated with reduced function. And up to 20% of available x-rays showed some form of hip deformity, which we know affects movement. 13% had moderate hip OA changes. So again, coexisting disorders are probably more common than we previously recognized. And these, these disorders begin prior to the the onset of hip OA. And again, this is the first study that's large in nature that's kind of trying to demonstrate this. So again, I feel like it's very important to examine the hip when I've seen somebody for back pain. So who are the patients? That was the other question. And I was giving a lecture on hip spine somewhere at a national meeting, and this gentleman actually emailed me, and he's out of Austin, Texas. And I had two of my partners almost went to that practice before I hired them, which is 
funny, but uh, anyway, he wrote me and he said, you know, I consider the hip-spine connection when I evaluate patients every day, but I never put it on my impression plan. And I don't think there's even a CP, there's a CP or a ICD-10 code for everything, but I haven't found this one yet. So um, it's, it's, it's true. That was very astute. So if we start thinking about it like this, people with lumbopelvic pelvic pain in the middle, do they have an accentuated pelvic girdle disorder, lumbar spine disorder, intraarticular hip disorder, or extraarticular hip disorder? And I see these things as all converging in, in the lumbar pelvic pain. So theoretical mechanisms, movement of the hip increases lumbar pelvic motion. We should consider extraarticular, intraarticular pelvic girdle. And we know structure affects function. We know intraarticular hip disorders are identified by structure, so some without degenerative changes, and these may or may may or may not have labral tear be symptomatic. They may be asymptomatic. And the degeneration, including AVN and osteoarthritis. Remember, too, up until this last year, there was a consensus, international consensus sta statement came out and said, if we're going to call something FAI, we're going to call it, you know, symptomatic. Prior to that, it was still really just an anatomical diagnosis. So making sure you're clear with patients about if you think that's symptomatic or not is, is probably important. We, we've talked a little bit about this, but we know dysplasia is just a shallow acetabulum. You usually have decreased uh, stability and they have inadequate femoral head coverage. Again, the patients have come complex that we described in our paper. 83% of them were limping. They often had a trinolumbar sign, and they often had impingement signs. If we looked at femoral acetabular impingement, again, a bony abutment of the femoral head, neck junction against the acetabular rim, can cause damage to the labrum rim and, and to the cartilage and eventually into osteoarthritis. Oftentimes, again, these patients have impingement signs, they limp, and they may have reduced motion. Asymptomatic with x-ray findings can be up to as many as 25% uh, in males and 7% in females, and that was a uh, consensus study out of a F award um, an NIH uh, consensus meeting, and I think it's even higher now. I think they're considering it up, up around 30%. Again, just uh, to reconvene about what uh, there's different types. There's pincer and cam, but most people have a mixed um, of the two. So theoretical mechanisms. So if we think about pre-arthritic hip pain, so that would include all the folks with FAI and all the folks with DDH, um, with or without cartilaginous changes. Um, the surgical perspective, well, we, we think about bony abutment leads to cartilage wear and tear, inflammation, aberrant momentum, and regional pain. So if we could correct this, we would actually improve their pain problem. We know issues unique to females in this group. FAI is now actually considered more prominent in females than males. Females have a greater pain and reduced function with smaller measurements of deformity. So it takes less of a change on an imaging finding for for the female population that may have uh, worse pain and function scores. Females are more likely to have connective tissue disorders and hypermobility, which is a great example of a case we saw prior to this talk. And then females with hip disorders may also have pelvic floor disorders, and you need to ask this. So the 101 people walking in, 60 something percent of, 60 of them were women, and 28% of them have pelvic floor pain. They thought I was crazy asking them if they had pelvic floor pain. I'm here for my back. Why are you asking me these questions? But there's definitely um, some overlap. And then we know bone health is a greater uh, risk for uh, women across their lifespan. So if we go, especially in the, in the physiatry model, when we were looking at aberrant motion, and we know people have compensatory pain and surrounding, and that can affect their hip, their pelvis, and the lumbar spine, maybe if we correct this, we'll never get to uh, becoming symptomatic here related to the bony abnormality. But could we actually, if we can get that to happen, if we can actually affect motion prior to an inflammatory reaction occurring, we may not actually end up with lumbopelvic pain. So again, looking at those motions across the hip and pelvis can be quite important uh, for maybe preventing other problems in the future. So what population would really benefit from prevention? Well, this kind of leads into some of our old soccer data on girls that we did in St. Louis. And I looked at, a co I've got a cohort of 550 girls now in this, in this group. We started with uh, grade schoolers to middle schoolers, high schoolers. I have a D1 college team. And for a brief period of time, there was a professional uh, women's soccer team in St. Louis, and their dad is in this group. And we looked at all of them who were asymptomatic, and we were looking to see um, uh, 
what kind of uh, hip motion they have because we know it's associated with low back pain and we know that a reduced internal rotation and hip flexion is also associated with ACL injury. So we looked at their hip motions. Our average age in the group was 16.7. Again, we divide them into those three groups. The professionals had less hip flexion and internal rotation on um, preferred kicking side. The grade school and middle schoolers compared to all other groups had more external rotation in both hips. And positive provocative hip tests, this is an asymptomatic cohort, we have about 400 people in it, were positive in 22% of all players and 36% of the professionals. None of them are having symptoms of back or hip pain. It's there. It's smoldering. It's, you know, something that probably needs to be addressed, particularly when we look at training patterns. In professional, a positive provocative test was also associated with ipsilateral decreased hip flexion. So that's my group I really need to have imaging on because probably we're predicting a, a deformity there. So our conclusion was um, less bilateral hip flexion and preferred kicking leg and internal rotation was found um, in more experienced and less experienced athlete. And again, positive provocative tests were found even in asymptomatic pro. Group. So what we really need to find out is, do these findings link to risk for intraarticular hip or lumbar spine pain and knee disorders, which I think now that we're, we're going back into our, our data because I'm going to be able to follow my 10-year-olds, they're now in high school, we're going to go back and we're asking them those questions now. So again, our functional targets improve quantity, uh, quantity of motion only if it's available, right? If they don't have the motion, we shouldn't try to crank on it if it's a bony, a bony change. Uh, but also improve quality of motion, improve the symmetric or distribution of force, and again, that crisscross between the hip, the pelvis, and the spine uh, needs to look symmetrical. So what are the treatments related to these intraarticular things? Well, education is really a big thing, and it's not very sexy. Telling people what not to do is just not very glamorous, right? They come, you, come to you and you have this uh, need to do something, right? And a lot of times it's talking to them about what things are bad for their hip, like the stretch that this uh, lady's doing over here on the right. Activity modification is not something they want to hear, right? The lady we just, we just examined before we came in here, she doesn't really want me to tell her to um, <clears throat> stop her activity level. She's kind of doing it on her own because she's hurting. Um, but we have to figure out how to modify those activities and what it is that's provoking her. And then we got to address some other things, which I'm going to talk about here later. Neuromuscular re-education, we know, um, is a big part of, what, uh, of providing that both strength and control across the hip and uh, lumbopelvic spine. And other th the things that can help with that are tactile stem, tape, brace, ultrasound feedback. I mean, when you can show somebody their abdominal wall contracting and what it does to their hip flexor, sometimes that's better than the biofeedback with the little blips on a screen. Um, I'll use that. Dry needling can be helpful. And then visual feedback, looking at symmetry in the mirror. Um, can be quite helpful. You also, we're looking to reduce muscle tone when resting tone is high and restore muscle length and strength, obviously, if there's a deficit there. I think we pointed those out in the, in the lady we examined before. Again, these are all very dependent on what the patient needs, and your prescription needs to be individualized to that. We also know we can always go to injections and surgery in this group. Injections can be helpful. We've got to worry about how much steroid we put in. I can't wait till we really figure out what else to put in these folks when they're acutely inflamed, whether that's PRP, whether that's orange juice, whether that's stem cell, whatever it is. I can't wait for us to figure that out because I, I don't like putting steroid in people who we know have an early cartilaginous problem, and I'm just going to help promote the problem. But sometimes you've really got to do that, and I often sometimes will, will trigger doing that earlier in the course when I'm seeing him, particularly in somebody who's had pain for a long period of time. The lady we just saw is a year, year and a half into it. At some point, you've got to diminish pain before you can move forward. So that's how I think about it. But a lot of times that's where my, my talk would end. But I want to talk about this because this is the thing I'm trying to bring to St. Uh, Louis at WashU right now. And it really fits physiatry. I really think this is a, a role we can play, particularly as musculoskeletal uh, people in the musculoskeletal world can help promote. And what about the wellness approach? So half the adults over the age of 65 or older have arthritis. Two-thirds of adults are overweight or obese, and anxiety is the number one adult mental illness of which only a third are treated. 21% of adults smoke. The money we spend on this is atrocious. $281.5 billion annual cost for joint pain and arthritis, and then by 2030, we think that more than 4.4 million lower extremity total joint procedures were performed, costing around $154 billion. $147 billion costs are associated with people who are overweight or obese. That's just associated, right? 
And then we know $42 billion a year is spent on anxiety disorders. Ha over half of that is associated with repeated use of healthcare services. People with anxiety and disorders seek relief for symptoms that mimic a physical illness. And boy, do we see that, right? We're the largest, uh, we, we have Promise now, I don't know if you're familiar with that, which is an outcome score, it's a CAT analysis. We're handing it out to every single patient that walks in the orthopedic department. We have 60 providers. We have the largest implementation in the country right now. And we're, we're measuring physical, functional, physical function, pain and interference, anxiety and depression, and I scream for anxiety. And they went along with me and we put it in. And uh, the physiatrists, if you compare them, there's six or seven of us now, compared to the 55 uh, surgeons, the number of people we see with a depression or anxiety scale that's off the standard norm is about 40% more than the surgeon is. So I hopefully publish that because I think it, it speaks a lot to the things we have to deal with that just cannot be done in 30 seconds in a room. And they take time and they need to be addressed. So patients with musculoskeletal disorders um, often have co-founding problems. Again, weight, disordered eating, addiction to tobacco. They have these biopsychosocial and economic risk factors. Again, that could be fear avoidance, catastrophization, not just bipolarism and schizophrenia, but real everyday common issues that interfere with them getting better. Pain processing disorders and the lack of poor education regarding self-management, right? How do you bill for educating somebody about how to manage their problem right now? Say they're a level three because I examined so many body parts. Did you get extra kudos for spending 10 more minutes in the room educating them? No. And that's the big problem, is our healthcare environment really lacks incentives um, for us to educate patients. The comprehensive patient goal directed and integrated programs are very hard to run because they haven't made a lot of money for folks in the past. And then the model in which to promote services are not covered by third party payers. And this is a big problem for us in St. Louis. So, um, getting outpatient psych services for somebody with a general average problem is extremely difficult. We don't have a lot of providers. Nutritional counseling, the number of private providers we have in St. Louis is few and far between. It's around $150 an hour, which a very few number of my patients can afford. Um, and so you know sometimes I'm sitting in the room, I know exactly what the patient needs, but I don't know how to get it to them because of lack of services and lack of of insurance company, and I think it's quite crazy if obesity is that big of a problem in the United States that the only way you get health, your health insurance to cover you is if you have diabetes or renal failure. It's crazy. So this is my proposal to try to get rid of some of this. So we think about structural disorders, we fix the disorder, the pain is reduced and function is improved. You can think about it that way, and I would say my surgical colleagues are trained very well on this side of the graph, and then we know a little bit more about movement disorders, and we change the abarement movement, pain is reduced and function improved. We think we'll be successful, and we've talked about that today already. But the other things that are evident or not so evident that need to be addressed are modifications of pain, all of these other things we just talked about. And I won't talk about healthcare provider behavior, but that's one of them. <laughs> and then improve, again, if we active participation in treatment, correction of aberrant motion, pain, and function. Again, if we address this in addition to those other things, will this really be our successful point? Can we really move the arm on other disorders patients have in addition to their musculoskeletal complaint? And is their musculoskeletal complaint their entry into the system where we improve health? This fits our model perfectly. I like this is actually out of the European uh, Journal for uh, PM&R. And it, it shows you up at the top where pain leads to pain catastrophizing, pain-related fears, fear avoidance, disability, depression, but there's this offshoot into weight gain and obesity. These are all so interconnected, right? It's right in front of us all the time. Let's look at what are, what are the benefits of reducing fear avoidance. Well, this, these are all out of Europe, too. Comparison of multidisciplinary programs with behavioral management and exercise alone for patients with chronic low back pain. And guess what? Those that got behavioral management did statistically and clinically significantly better. And the exercise only group really didn't have a change. And the conclusion was that these groups were superior in reducing disability, fear avoidance pain, and enhancing their quality of life. But the big take home thing is it, have, it lasted for a year after the intervention. And they were only, their study point was at a year. So it may have lasted longer. That's impressive. If we look at the benefits of reducing pain, catastrophizing, again, same group, randomized controlled study of 148 patients with chronic low back pain. They attended a multidisciplinary treatment program with, op with it consisting of an operant behavioral treatment plus cognitive coping skills training. 
The another group had just group discussion, and the other group was allocated to a waiting list. So this is socialized medicine. You're on the list, and you get a next, which is a great way to study the differences between the two because you've got this whole cohort you can compare there to uh, that we would not be able to do this design in the United States. But if you looked at the results of that, the multidisciplinary program improvement, they improved in depression, pain behavior, their activity tolerance was better, they had decrease in catastrophization, uh, mediated reduction in the level of depression and pain behavior, and these improvements, again, were uh, effective post-treatment at least 12 months afterwards. And again, they don't have follow-up data past the 12 months. They were still improved at 12 months. So again, this is, really speaks significantly that if we, if we pay attention to this or we can add this into part of our treatment program, it will be very helpful. Now, I don't work around a lot of physical therapists that have cognitive behavioral training. In fact, I thought most did until I started teaching at the PT school at Wash U, which is still ranked number one in the country. They have zero behavioral management training in their program. Zero. So those folks that you work with as physical therapists, some of them just get it because of huspa, right? The, who they are, how well they work with people, their experience, but they don't necessarily have formal training in it, which to me was, that was new. So we can't expect that a physical therapist can just provide this. They need that expertise just like you and I need that expertise and something we need to, to think about um, implementing further. And then there's nutrition. You know, we only get out what you put in. There's lots of great literature now looking at cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and the crux of both of these is inflammation. And they're showing good results when you do reduce inflammation, particularly in the diet, that you reduce burden of both of these. Like you can get somebody off their diabetic meds if you can reduce inflammatory components in their diet. My, my proposal would be, well, my guess is the next thing on here is going to be pain, right? A lot of our folks have an inflammatory underlying disorder related to their musculoskeletal condition. And again, if reducing that may also help reduce things above. So there's lots of um, groups looking at this now, and it's all uh, inflammation as far as how it harms our system at, down at the endothelial dysfunctional level. And I would say we need to add pain as an arrow going into this diagram here. But if we think about that as far as food as medicine then, on what we input in trying to reduce inflammation, we think about foods that reduce inflammation. Those are your pigmented veggies, sweet potatoes, cherries, berries, pomegranates, basil, cinnamon, ginger, and of course, red wine, which I put in red for you, so you won't forget that. And then, um, then there's the things we need to avoid in the setting of inflammation, which is processed food, saturated fats, bread, pasta, fried food, and preservatives. And as my fellow from last year said, well, if you can't remember any of that, just remember to eat real food. Right? And I think that's what people are starting to talk about, you know, eating cleanly and that type of thing. Um, but there's probably a lot more to this than we don't give attention to, um, even though it's right in front of us. So again, nutritional counseling can be something, and we're looking at not just reducing weight, but how do I eat so I feel better? What am I sensitive to? What's creating inflammation in my system? And that, again, their conduit into this improvement in their health may be their MSK problem they present to us with. So. Uh, this was just some abstracts at the last NAS meeting, and you know, there's uh, as far as the effects of obesity uh, on the spine, and it's not just the weight of the spine. There's implant failure and infections postoperatively, but that first one up there was in a pig study, and it showed that the leptin, which is a cytokine, if they took the, the fatty tissue out of the spinal canal and they put it in a dish next to the disc itself, the disc degenerated. So that's an inflammatory cytokine substance touching the other substance in, in enhancing the degenerative cascade. Animal model, see where it goes from here. But again, it wasn't just the weight on the spine, it's an inflammatory process that's going on. Switch it over to sleep. Hopefully most of you do cancel your patients on sleep, but just even their chronic low back pain population, 10% versus 3.4% of controls, um, it's a big problem. And it, it can be just a short number of minutes that can make somebody have restorative sleep versus not. Um, we looked at this in just our young uh, adult hip patients, so they had to be under the age of 50, and they, we did provocative hip tests that put us into giving uh, or taking an x-ray. That's how they qualified for the study. Average age in, in this population in our office was 31. Their BMI, thank goodness, was under 30 at 26.3. Very happy with that in St. Louis because sometimes we have a hard time with that. Mean length of time reporting pain was chronic at 32 months, and their mean average pain on, was around a 5, plus or minus 2. We compared their PASS, which is an anxiety score, and an insomnia index to age and gender match control. So these are young, active, 
the lady you know, we just examined would qualify for this study, and we asked them, are you anxious and are you sleeping? And oh my, were they so about as good of p-values as you can get. So they all had, uh, on average, they had very statistically significant problems with sleep and, and with anxiety. Now, this is not something the average, at least in my office, orthopedic hip surgeon is thinking about in a 22-year-old with hip pain that's been there for a year, not asking about it. And I, I was telling Venu, um, I was recently with Dr. Closey, and he was talking about this 17-year-old in the office, and she's had two hip surgeries, and her back hurts, and I don't know what to do, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, she's, she's had it how long? It's three and a half years. I said, well, there's not a surgery we know of that cures chronic pain, right? He says, yeah. I said, these are all components of it. So again, we're astute at this, and it's, it's always on our front burner, um, I think, making sure our colleagues around us understand that these are some underlying components in folks with, who look to be young and pretty healthy. So we know treating sleep disorders are, pro, are important. Getting rid of stimulants, repetitive sleep patterns are important, medications when we need them, um, and those are a list of some of the favorites that, that I, I tend to use. Benefits of aerobic exercise to manage pain, again, um, we all preach and speak this. I, I, I give you this study because it showed that the aerobic exercise group, um, uh, as compared to just PT alone, did significantly better. In the tune of it, looked like almost like having a Percocet for one single session. Their mood and pain perception dramatically changed, and their regular exercise training was useful to treat chronic pain. So again, uh, this is a great one to hand folks and say, you know, this is almost like a pill. Go out and exercise for a little while, and it, we know it, it affects you. So with all those things in mind, I've proposed to our university a center for well-being. And if you're the physiatrist with that patient in the middle, you have all these choices of how you treat patients, particularly spine or musculoskeletal disorders. And these four in red, I do not have available to me in my system, including nutritional counseling, smoking cessation that's available and ready to patients who are working actively, aerobic exercise, education, and biopsychosocial risk management. So I've gone to my hospital and said I want to build a center that incorporates this um, together. And none of these interventions are offered in a comprehensive programmatic approach, particularly in my area. Right now, a Dr. Google or their friend on the elevator a lot of times directs their care more than I do or more than some other healthcare professional. And they try one thing at a time, and everybody's off on a spoke, and it's, we're using a lot of healthcare services, and people aren't getting better. So this is our opportunity for intervention. So our center at our, this is at a, a, a community-based area where we also have a breast health center, we have a bariatric program, and our spine and joint center will be moving there. And this is the group I'm going to try to attract um, to the center in, in systematic, programmatic ways. We'll offer physical therapy, aerobic count, uh, exercise, counseling, medical massage, acupuncture, manual medicine. The biopsychosocial risk count will be a counselor, and we're going to use a mid-level provider and a postdoc to keep our costs down. Nutritional counseling will be run by one dietitian, and then we'll farm it. Uh, implementers will be uh, more like life coaches or coaches to help with implementation of that. And then a smoking cessation program that's accessible to our musculoskeletal patient. So if you're Ms. Ima Hurton and you have hip pain and FBI with a labral tear, the risk factors for a good outcome in this patient might be that she has a BMI of 32, she smokes, she has high risk for fear avoidance because we've taken, given her a tool that shows us that. Diet, she's diabetic and she's unable to exercise because of her pain. She's not going to be the greatest candidate to take to surgery and is immediately going to do well. So she would be a candidate for the center. We'd assess her risk. We'd, make her go to, uh, we'd have her go to smoking cessation classes versus individual treatment. She'd go to physical therapy with our usual goals. And if she, as she passed that, she would be passed to the aerobic exercise uh, counselor. So we might only need four sessions of PT and two of the exercise counselor, and that would reduce our healthcare utilization of PT alone. Counseling goal would be to understand and self-management of fear avoidance. Um, we'd look at nutritional counseling, and weight reduction would be one of her goals. And based on how much she needed to lose, we might send it to our weight management program versus our bariatric program that would be housed in the same location. Now here's the really you know, unique idea, which you all are laughing because this is not rocket science. Then every two weeks, based on which of the disciplines the patient um, was you needed to have utilized or stratified into, there would be a team meeting. Isn't that original, right? And the idea here is, one, you're setting goals, and you're making sure the patient's marching through the program, so there's a discharge, so patients aren't just continuously utilizing services. Number two, there's cross-education. My psychologist or uh, postdoc can now start counseling the exercise specialist or the physical therapist or the nutritional counselor about what works best with this patient. 
Is it power suggestion? Is it don't ever talk about what the pain level is? What is it? Because if we all get on the same page, we might actually get the patient through the program. Three things will happen. They'll either march through the program and be discharged to whatever their goal is. And this lady's goal might be to have a hip arthroscopy. Um, they might not comply, so we shouldn't continue to use health care resources on them. So they'll out. Or three, they run into a pain problem or something stutters them. Instead of going to 16 sessions of therapy and then deciding it's not work, we're going to cite it here, and we'll have an intervention, hopefully, that puts them back on track, whether it's different med, they need an injection, we need to quit this exercise and do something else. But we decide about it on a group with a progress meeting. So now, once she's gone through the program, she's had weight reduction, her diabetes is under better control, she stopped smoking, self-management of fear avoidance is in place, and self-management of her therapeutic and exercise is in place. This lady should do well postoperatively. So her improved outcome for her hip um, hopefully, we've, we've satisfied that goal, but really, really where our impact could be, didn't we improve our overall health? Didn't we just use decreased health care utilization? And that would be the bigger goal. So as an intake in these folks, we'll be getting hemoglobin A1C in their blood pressure. So if I could start to show that their improved outcome not only changes their improvement in their pain complaint or they did better after surgery, but I reduced their blood pressure and their hemoglobin A1C, now we have real impact on our health care globally. So that's our goal. And I've just been given um, the green light on a pilot. So hopefully you'll have more from me. We'll see if I can get anybody to go through the program with me. So in summary, who are the patients we talked about today? Patients with low back pain may have structural disorders in the hip that affect motion, and we need to be aware of that. They also may have pain associated with movement of the hip that may not all be intraarticular. The mechanisms, again, can be bony changes, adaptive patterns, or even neuromuscular effects of poor control. Our functional targets are always quality and quantity of motion and motor control across the place. And again, our treatments, again, education, neuromuscular control, muscle length and strength, the cognitive behavioral aspects, and again, we should be adding this wellness approach to be in part of our armamentarian. So I'll leave you with consider the hip. It will change your thinking about low back pain. So thank you. Talked really fast. Sorry, I didn't want to keep anyone staying. Any questions? Yeah. Does this? Yeah. Yeah. What do I think? Yeah, if they can't wait bare, I'd say go for the hip surgery. And the hip surgery is much more predictive that they do well. You know, it was the surgery of the decade when it came out. And maybe they won't have to have their back surgery. Who knows? I mean, that's what I, that's usually the way I go with it. If they have a lot of pain with weight bearing, that's not something I can overcome usually with changing movement. So that's usually where I go. And there's a number of them that don't have their back surgery. So, and that fits with the literature. So. Or need to the same way. They have pain with weight bearing, and you inject them, and the neural tension sign goes away temporarily, but it comes back because they continue to not walk very well. Usually, we go for that. And again, I have I can't name one that's had a discectomy after that. I'm thinking about it hard here, but I can't remember one that ended up having a discectomy after that. Anything else? <laughs> Yeah, I would because she's already got cartilaginous change. She's a year and a half into it. And I'm looking for diagnostically where is it going to take me in the Y in the road, as well as can we just get some pain muted here so this lady can start to weight bear without as much pain. Because the pain is probably limiting her progress. Probably her weakness is limiting her progress. And definitely her hypermobility she's going to fight. And that's a, that's a big problem for her. That she's got kind of big, heavy legs. And um, trying to get neuromuscular control in the setting of pain, um, it's a big challenge. So I would, I would do things to shut down her pain and start over with the therapeutic approach. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, my son's in the back. He'll, he'll talk to you about how much I've screamed at home about this. Um, uh, yeah, I asked for a pilot. Um, my hospital made $11 billion last year, right? They're non for profit. They made $11 billion. The pilot will cost $65,000. I'm asking for one day a week of a psychologist and a nutritional counselor. The rest of it is absorbed. My department will absorb my salary I put into it, the whole thing. It's like a penny falling out of their pocket, and they, have, they wouldn't even know it's gone, right? And my last meeting was uh, with the hospital administrator saying, if you can't show that the pilot will make the money, they're not going to approve it. What I didn't know is the following week is my chairman had put a proposal in where the hospital splits money with the university. And chairmen sit around a table and decide which of these programs will get funded. And it's usually for startup funds to hire a new faculty member. And I'm, well, I'm comfortable with it because I sat on the committee for about six years. They voted it in without me being there to give this talk. So physicians, not even in musculoskeletal care, recognized how important this was. And so I was asking for 65000 I got 368000 <laughs> from the faculty that voted it in. So I, hopefully I'll have it up and going. With by the summer is my goal. But yeah, the president of the hospital realizes you might not do, some people might not have surgery if we do this. Yep, you're right. You're right. But you know, uh, population health is coming. We're already in the bundle. They're incentivized for me to do it in the total joint patient because hopefully I'm going to decrease the risk. I keep pouncing on that, you know, spine is coming. Probably it's going to be spine fusion in the bundle that's coming. And the spine fusion rate of success nationally is around 50%. That's a lot of risk to reduce. We better be armed with something that helps us, you know, and sets us apart that way. I, I am going to talk to you. Um, I got four health insurance companies locally that want to talk to me about it, and I'm going to actually ask them for additional money. So if I can show them what a system does for back and lower extremity pain, I know they want that, especially in my region. So hopefully I'll get a few extra dollars out of that that I can do some research with. But um, yeah, you hit it on the nose. That's been my stumbling block is I might save some money. <laughs> so, but if we could start associating what we do decreases blood pressure or decreases the hemoglobin A we see, I think, I think we can move in a, a really bigger direction even than where we are now. So, OK. <laughs> Yeah, it keeps getting, pfft. oh, and joint replacement, it depends on the surgeon, um, 16 weeks, it's the one that's out there longest. And, and that would even be a first scope. Um, I went into it thinking um, that I need to do this. I need to represent my field. Um, you know, this is going to be kind of hard because I'm, I'm a small voice and, and you know, I, I work in a surgical department, so I face it every day that my voice is often different um, and sometimes not heard. <laughs> but um, I got more out of it for myself than I ever thought I would. Um, I got to meet so many people. Uh, that I would never have met, and they had to meet me. And it was interesting, like going, I went to China twice to speak, and there was this uh, Chinese Orthopedic Association, there were 52,000 orthopedic surgeons in one building. And it was only one of the centers. There would be 3,500 people at my lecture. There were two women on the podium of the whole, whole meeting. I was almost late to my second lecture because they had to, they had to, um, changed the female bathrooms into male bathrooms. So the female bathroom was a 45. They actually had to take me in a cart to get me to <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's so eye-opening. And when you have 3,500 people in your room and they all have a camera, you're like, this is crazy. Why are they doing this? This is crazy. And then they put a spine fellow with me from China um, who spoke English well. And you know, he was, his, he was a research fellow. And at the end, I said, hey, thanks for taking me around and scooting me around. And he says, is there anything I can do to help you? He goes, well, I'm having a hard time getting references. I go, well, what do you mean? He says, well, the only way we can get on PubMed or Scopus is there's two computers at another hospital that's three train rides away. And by the time I'm out of surgery, I can't get there. His whole purpose was to do research. And he can't get access to it. And that's why they all had a camera. 
as I put references up on my on my on my post. So things like that were just so eye opening to me. So I I kind of go down with my my big reference uh, hard drive that I carry with me when I travel and downloaded everything into his computer. And you thought I'd given him the world. Um, so those types of experiences were were just phenomenal. Um, I think learning how to get consensus in a room is always good. I think we're natural at it. Um, I learned that. I th you think it's something everybody has, but your PM&R training really puts you ahead of other folks about how do you get to consensus and how do you get input from multiple people and come up with a decision. And that is not inherent to a lot of other physician groups, so it really will set you apart. And particularly in what's coming towards us, um, if we are supposed to be managing populations of people, I think we're going to be really well suited for it. That was very roundabout. Did I get it? <laughs> okay. Else? All right. Well, thanks for listening.